Well, hello there. It is truly an honor to be here. Oh my God, you look good. Really, under the lights, you look good. <laughs> I hope under the lights, I look good. All right, thank you very much. One of the things that uh, I'm going to share with you today, a talk, most people will say, gee whiz, why are you talking about that? It is about a community, developing a community of mattering. In a community where apathy has replaced love, the challenge might be that people don't care because they don't feel cared about. I'm going to tell you a little story about me. Well, actually, it will be about me. <laughs> I was born in a small town of about 64,000 people. I had so much space to roam around, feel free, and I was free. And at age three, my mother, because I was roaming around a little bit too much, had actually developed this long cord and had tied me to a tree so that I wouldn't wander too far off. Well, there were two ladies in the neighborhood who lived across the street, and they were recruiting students for school. And they had a little private school, and they were trying to get all these students to come to the school. And they saw me across the street and said, well, maybe we can get little Barbara. So they asked my mother, and she agreed. You know why. <laughs> this little willful child, she thought, OK, maybe she can succeed in school. Well, they took me in, and the miracle was because largely I was potty trained. <laughs> so I went to that school until I was six. Well, it finally folded, and now I'm not in private school, but I'm entering public school. They said, no, 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 this girl cannot be six years old in the third grade. Impossible. So they put me back in kindergarten. How many of you like to be put back? No. Whoa, no. So there I was in this little annex, which was on the outskirts of the schoolyard. And every day, I would walk up to the third grade, sit on the first row. I did this for a week. The teacher would always send me back. And finally, the principal called my mom. We had to come to the school, and she brought me. And I remember this. I was six at that time. And he said, well, it's a little impossible. This child's six years old in the third grade. My mother said, she's a very willful child. She's insisting that she belongs in the third grade. So he said, well, we'll have to test her to see if actually she can progress. Can she do the work? Well, I graduated with those kids that I met in third grade. <laughs> 15 years of age, I went off to college. Go, ooh. <laughs> Most people go, ooh. At 15, I'm in college. And actually, during the time that I graduated from high school during the 50s, there were certain things that were taking place in this country. One, we were rebuilding after World War II. Number two, it was a social, political, tumult time. We had civil rights legislation that was passed in 1954 for integration of schools. I graduated from high school in 1954, and I don't go counting up. <laughs> 15, OK. And <laughs> but coming along during a time when it was prohibition and inhibition, and particularly for females. So I was to follow in a sequence which was lockstep from school to what? Marriage to motherhood, and follow the line as my mother, my grandmother, aunts had. Now, I come from a long line of educators, teachers, and nurses. So the expectation that I was going to be a teacher. Bah. Well, I stopped out at 17. I met this handsome man at 17. By the time I was 19, I had two children and an MIA husband. So now, I'm at a crossroad. But one of the things that happened to me when I was growing up, and I remember at 13 years of age, I had female mentors who implanted into me love, empowerment, and significance. They loved me. They embraced me as I was. They empowered me by telling me I could be anything I wanted to be. They gave me significance 
by saying you matter, you are important. Now it took me many years for that to resonate and come back to me. Because after two failed marriages and now three children, I was an incomplete. I had not finished the BA degree. And I knew that I was an incomplete. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I knew it, but I didn't tell anybody. Most people said, oh, you went to UC Berkeley. I said, yes, but they didn't ask me, did I graduate? And I didn't tell. <laughs> but I knew. At age 36, I went back and recalled I had female mentors, mostly, my mother, my grandmother, aunts, people in the community who had given me those three things, love, empowerment, and significance. At 36, I said, whoa, it hit me. I need to go back, continue what I studied at 15. And when I made that step, let me tell you, it was a significant one because I had to admit to people that I didn't have a degree. But I lost that pride, let that ego go, and stepped into my destiny where I would not be standing in front of you today. Seven short years, say seven, <laughs> I finished the BA, the master's, and after about a year or two hiatus, I entered a doctoral program. I was in such a hurry, I finished it in three years, wrote my dissertation in eight months. Now all that's to say, not as Paul had talked about success and failures. We all know we make mistakes. I had made a mistake, but I owned up to it in the fact I had really felt I was a failure. But I realized one important thing, that I had come from a community that cared and shared and helped their young people. Now, because of this, all of these degrees, I spent most of my professional career in education, in higher ed. I became a professor and I taught for 17 years. And one of the things I always did was to encourage my students, make them feel they mattered, make them feel they were significant, and that was important to me, to establish a community of mattering. Now there comes a day, and it came a day, and maybe for you, because for some of you sitting in those seats, maybe this might be something to encourage you. I reached that point where I said, what is it that really, really gives me joy? What makes me happy? I have been in education all these years. Now it's about 37 total. And I'm thinking, there's something else. What is it that makes me happy? What gives me joy? And I discovered that. Encouraging people, motivating them. I hate that word now. It's like speaking life. Helping them to understand that you're special, that there is a destiny for you. So what did I do? I took a leap of faith and I started my own company to become, at that time, a motivational speaker. I later changed because there are so many on the market, I changed and I became life empowerment speaker because I speak life. And when I launched this second career, I found myself, voila, traveling all of the United States to the continent of Africa, where among my travels, I was asked to speak to a boarding school of eighth grade girls. Now, among all of my travels and speaking engagements, I'm working with adults, not 13-year-old girls. So I'm thinking, should I accept this uh, boarding school? It's on the outskirts of Nairobi, Kenya. Um, what can I say to 13-year-old girls? What is the message? What I accepted? And I had 350 girls, eighth grade girls, coming in quietly. Good afternoon, Dr. Young. They were polite, respectful. I was thinking, oh my god, these are eighth graders? <laughs> <laughs> They're not like that in the United States. <laughs> wow. So I, I really didn't know. I said, I got to get them going, because it was so quiet and reserved, polite. And I started singing a song to get them going. That got them going. Singing does it. And then I began to ask inquiries. Uh, what are you guys good at? What do you like to do? What are your favorite subjects? Math, 
science, I'm, math, science, how many languages? I found out those girls spoke six and seven languages. Now these were poor girls from up country and had been given the opportunity to come to this boarding school. I asked them, what would you like to be when you grow up? Engineers, astronauts, doctors, lawyers, airline pilots, nuclear physicists. I said, oh my goodness. That resonated with me because I knew in my heart of hearts that many of these young girls would not be able to realize their dream. I said, how does that translate? And what must I do? I came back to the United States, fired up to do something with 13-year-old girls. I looked around in my community and listen to this. Two years prior to that visit, I had started a foundation, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I was supposed to start it, but I wasn't sure where I should focus the programs. Ha, I knew then, I need to focus on teen girls. So I established a teen leadership academy for middle school girls. That was my goal. I went to the district, I went to the mayor, I went to the chamber of commerce, I went to the school, the school site. They allowed me to work with those girls. One condition, would you make a presentation to all of the eighth grade students so that all eighth grade girls will have an opportunity to apply to this program? I spent a day speaking to seven gym classes at that school so that all 280 girls would have an opportunity to participate in the program. Out of that, we established a pilot with 29 girls and their parents. Because I believe, educate a parent, you educate a child. With love, empowerment, and significance. So what did we do? We engaged the whole community the district, the counselors, the nonprofit staff, volunteers, guardians, parents, the teenagers themselves, foster youth, foster parents, counselors, all involved in a community of mattering. Using these three things, love, significance, and empowerment. Now, what are the outcomes of this? 16 sessions we spent with these young ladies. What are the outcomes? We have 29 girls that are 10th graders now. 4.0 GPAs. They speak two languages, <laughs> Spanish and English. <laughs> They're student body leaders. They're head of the wrestling team, basketball team, and track team. These girls are moving and shaking and making a difference in high school as leaders. They're taking their places through these three things. What are the parents doing? Out of this program, there are six parents who have gone back to complete their high school education. Two have gone to complete an AA degree in community college. So we're not just establishing something for the girls but bringing the parents along too, to help them learn how to navigate their child's education, learn how to be a part of the process, not outside the process. You ask me, why did I do this? Because I remembered at 13, someone told me, and it wasn't just someone, it was me, that I could succeed, that I was worthy, I deserved an education. It would lead me to a quality life. You are the best. You can be anything you want to be. I remember that to instill in this program for these girls. All of these are players in a community of mattering. What I learned from this, one very important lesson, it doesn't matter where you come from. It really doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. 
It even doesn't matter what age you are, because I could be many of those girls' grandmothers. And I told them, when I told them my age, they went, oh, are you a model? Do you know Tyra Banks? Yes, I do. Best friend. Best friend. <laughs> and so I found that if you have love, compassion, willing to give of your time, it is so worth it to launch what I call stars for success. So a community of mattering is what we have done, launching stars for success. Thank you for listening.